It's time for the Daily Planet Podcast Show. So sit back, relax, and give us a go. Scott and Matt and maybe a guest undertaking an epic pod quest. We're gonna ramble on about movies and books and television and directors and film festivals and this really long list of stuff that I know nothing about, but they gave it to me and they really wanted me to read through it. And that's all I can really say about it, but it's gonna be great. The show. Hello and welcome to the Daily Planet Podcast, your weekly podcast for all things movie, TV, books, and anything else we feel like talking about. My name is Scott Daly and I'm your host and I'm joined as always by my co-host Matt Freeman. Matt, how's it going? It's doing well, Scott. Um, I'm excited about our talk about something today. <laughs> did, you, did you not remember what the topic is? No, I, I did. It's just something that I know nothing about. You you actually asked me, Matt, what's your what's your knowledge on this topic? And, I, and my immediate answer was three <laughs> percent. Um, so I'm I'm not qualified to introduce it. So I will I will bounce it back and 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 let you just handle that. All right, I, I I will introduce our topic. But before I do that, I want to introduce our guest because all right, Michael Grubb is back on the podcast after a a long long absence. Welcome back, Michael. Hello. <laughs> How's it going, man? It's going pretty good. Are, are I you, still watch movies. Do you on occasion? I actually haven't watched that many movies since the last time I was on here. The amount of movies I've watched is probably proportional to like the number of times I've been on here. Well, there you go. That's why. That's why. Yeah. But anyway, we are here to talk about the Final Fantasy series of video games, um, which is important because Final Fantasy 15 came out today. Um, right, Finally, right before this this podcast, I was off playing that game, and I think you were too, Michael. Um, I was, yeah. I was like, I wonder how far I can get before I have to do this podcast. <laughs> the answer is not very far. Um, <laughs> the answer is like one more travel quest. Where the guy's <laughs> like, ah, just kidding. We're actually going to meet at this other place. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so so Matt, you've obviously not played these games. Uh, or at least you played three no. percent of these games. I've I've watched I've watched them played intermittently by other people enough to get a sense of what Final Fantasy is sort of and and it, some of its trappings and motifs and the fact that they reuse character names. But I don't have any understanding of the game mechanics and so forth. So I'm going to be the um, the the audience surrogate. As long as you discussion. understand that Sid is a name that is that yeah. is in all of the <laughs> games, you, you pretty need. much get that's all you need. Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, then I'm, I'm good. All right. I'm good. Uh, bef before we jump into that conversation, I just wanted to go over some quick news items with you guys. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about, uh, you guys know who Lin-Manuel Miranda is, don't you? Of course. <laughs> Naturally. The, the, uh, the most famous person in the world, and after the success of Moona last week, probably the first EGOT, or the youngest EGOT winner in history of that particular set of awards. Um because he did music for Mona and it's it's excellent. Um but he had some some news that came out today. Um he's going to join join uh, adaptations of the K King Killer Chronicles, which is a, a a trilogy of epic fantasy novels. Have either of you read these? I've never read this series. I I have actually. Oh. Are they good? Um I read I they were good enough that I read all 3. <laughs> but I'm not good enough that I really remember them. <laughs> um, they, they, I, I don't remember them as being. So that's the one where the main character is an assassin, right? I, I have no idea. Okay, well, that's about all. I'm gonna all say, I can I'm gonna say yes anyway. I, I'm not gonna give it a super, super going review based on my lack of recollection. Yo, so Miranda's gonna be a a creative producer on the project. Um, and the plan right now is to adapt the story into both films and a tie-in TV series. And po and he's got Miranda's got rights to develop any Broadway future Broadway play in case they want to do that as well. Um, it sounds like a weird Broadway play, but but like every to interrupt you, no, um, every um, fantasy series that has been adapted to a television show, I, they haven't done that right yet. Have, have any of you seen the Shinar Chronicles that came out like this year or last year? No. No, it was also They've based also... on a fantasy series called um, Shannara, and uh, it's basically like just as bad as like the old like Xenas and and Conan the Barbarians that like would show on 
um wgn or whatever at like 11 o'clock at night <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. good i was just gonna say they've also done the magicians which from my understanding they just deviated dramatically from the actual plot of those books um and then of course there's this other um book series you may have heard of game of thrones <laughs> um but uh, yeah yeah and they kind of fucked that one up we don't want to go down that some, rabbit some hole. Belief. Some belief. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I guess if you're a big fan of these books, which there are apparently a lot of people, us uh, notwithstanding, um, this is very exciting for you because Lin Manuel Miranda continues to rule rule the world in whatever he does. So, um, I mean, he's going to compose all the music and write songs for the the film and TV adaptations, of course, because that's what he does. So, um, wait, is it a musical? I I don't. It, it was tough to tell by the the. The news article I read, I don't think it's a musical. The book wasn't a musical. Well, I don't, I don't know. How would you do a book musical? <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember how, any of the songs. How would you know? <laughs> yeah. It wasn't an iambic pentameter. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, I, I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to watch it because I'll watch anything uh, Miranda does at this point. I think he's a brilliant uh, person, but I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not excited just because I don't know the source material at all. Um, I try to compare this to the fact that there's a Dark Tower movie being made right now, which is a book series that I love, and I'm very excited about that. So I guess if, if I was as passionate about these movies as I was, these books as I was Dark Tower, then maybe uh, maybe I'd be really excited. But we'll see. I think it's weird that like to do a film and TV tie-in. That seems like you're biting off a lot in a series that you might not, that might not work as an adaptation. I don't know. Yeah, well... And I, I mean, I, I like Lin Manuel Miranda too. Although it would be better if he had a name that was easier to say. Um, <laughs> yeah. But like, a, a main reason I like him is just because um, he, he's, he's really good at lyrics and like spoken word poem delivery. Like, I've seen some of that kind of stuff he's done, and that's really good. I, I don't, and I, I don't know if that will translate to a television show. I'm not saying it won't. It probably will. I mean, if you're good at creating stuff, you're probably, as long as he has a vision for it, it'll probably be good. But it doesn't like automatically make me excited about it, I guess. I'm yeah. trying to say. But when, but when I hear an announcement like this, it reminds me of when, you know, James Cameron comes out and he's like, I'm going to be making seven more Avatar films. You're just like, <laughs> no, you're not. That's that's not actually going to happen. Like, yeah. like you're, 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 you're going to make one more and then you're going to assess whether it's a good idea to make more and yeah, yeah you're absolutely you right just... <clears throat> they'll make the film if the film does well they'll go forward with the other plans you're right yeah so and you know fantasy even fantasy films don't a lot of times take off i mean um no when they tried to do the um the dark materials series a while ago they stopped after the first one even though those books are pretty good yeah well that was a uh, really bad movie so I did it was a like bad the, movie. I did not but like, like I, I guess my point is like, for some reason, Hollywood doesn't know how to make good fantasy movies. Um, and like all of the little ones that come out, I mean, there was like Van Helsing, which was bad. Oh, that was there awful. was like the last witch, whatever, with with Vin Diesel, which was terrible. And like all of these little fantasy movies that come out, you just kind of forget about because they're just so bad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the trick is keeping the, the budget down. And bringing on someone as as high class and probably expensive as Miranda is probably not the way to keep your budget down. But um, I, I don't know. We'll see. That's yeah. I mean, like the the Dark Tower movie, like I'm very excited about that, but I do not think it's going to do well. Um, it's just a difficult thing to market. I mean, like if if you have read the books and you're into Stephen King, you'll go see that movie. But how many people is that? I don't know. Um, they've tried to keep the budget down, but I, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, Stephen King's not really like all the rage right now, like he was no. in the nineties. No, and his adaptations have been historically pretty bad yeah, for the most that's part. That's true, except for that whole Shawshank Redemption, which is like for some reason always rated the best movie of all time. Yeah, which I strongly disagree with, but whatever. Um, <laughs> moving on. Um, this is just a quick item I want to touch on. The National Board of Review uh, officially called Manchester by the Sea the best movie of the year. Um, this is the uh, um, the Affleck film. Um, wow, what's his name? The younger Affleck. <laughs> I just blanked on Casey. his name. Casey? 
What? Casey Affleck. There yeah. you go. I thought you said JC. I was like, no, that's not right. <laughs> yeah, Casey Affleck. Um, th- this I have yet to see this movie. I'm seeing it tomorrow, actually. Um, but I'm very excited about it. And it seems with with this declaration, this will be the front runner for uh, Best Picture Oscar. Um, so I, Michael, have you even seen the previews for this or anything? It looks. No, good. I don't know anything about it. It looks very good. Um, it, it it's an interesting film because it was originally. Uh, slated for Matt Damon to star in, um, but he couldn't do it because, or or his schedule got messed up because of both The Martian and the the new Jason Bourne movie. Um, so he he couldn't do it. Um, they wanted to wait for him to have clear schedule, but he was so passionate about the film that he um, didn't want to hold it up. So he said, "I will step off, but only if you give the role to Casey Affleck." So. <laughs> Casey was basically gifted this role and uh, it might win him an Academy Award because apparently he's incredible in it. So it's kind well, of it's a pretty good gift. It seems like Matt Damon is the type of friend you want to have. We should all be more yeah. like, more like Matt Damon. Yeah, lesson. I mean, he he still made movies with Kevin Smith, even though Kevin Smith is, a is bad person. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> very, very generous man. Yeah. All right, and, and the last news item I had is that Michael's mom is very excited about new Gilmore's Girls episodes. Uh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, the, the Netflix Gilmore Girls uh, edition, the f- additional four episodes, uh, came out last Friday, and I've watched them all already because uh, my fiancé was also very excited about this. Um, and we watched, we stayed up till 2 a.m. on Saturday last week watching were, four were they... minute episodes. Were they good? Did your did your girlfriend think they were good? She liked them. Um, I, I don't think she loved them as much as some of the earlier yeah. seasons. I've like, never to me. It just see it always seems kind of sad when they like bring back new episodes of old shows. Yeah, I think like so. First of all, I've never I've seen like eight episodes of Gilmore Girls before this, so I'm not an expert on the show at all. But from my understanding, um, the creators were kind of pushed out during the last season. And the last season did not end um, in a favorable way for fans and lovers of the show, and as well as the original creators of the show. So this, these four episodes were done by those original creators and writers. Um, so I think it, you can you can see it as like a proper send off for the show, um, which I think is the only way I'd be okay with this. Like, if I think of any of my favorite shows, and think of the idea of them coming back to do like reunion episodes, I. I don't want that. Um, yeah. But but I guess I guess in this case, if if the creators really didn't like where the people that took over took the characters, and they wanted to get their own um, take on it and their own send off for the characters, I guess that's fine. I mean, I I watched them having only watched eight episodes of the show before, and they were I mean they were okay. Like it was funny. Um, it's it's a very fast moving show. People talk very quickly. Um, with tons of pop culture references, um, I don't know. It, it wasn't bad, and I guess if you love the characters, I could see why it was a very enjoyable experience. But I don't know. Cool. Did your mom like them? Uh, she hasn't told me yet. She just told me that she was like really excited about watching them. Oh, well, we'll have we'll have we'll get a Michael's mom update. <laughs> we'll get we'll get uh, my mom <laughs> on the podcast next week. That's perfect. Perfect. <laughs> All right, so that's that's it for news. Um, let's move on to our main event. Let's talk Final Fantasy. So, Matt, we know what your history with Final Fantasy is, in that you don't have one. Um, right. Michael, why don't you talk about what yours is? What's your history with the series? Where where did My... you get into it? Um, or should we talk about what Final Fantasy is first before we go into our history with it? Um, I'm I'm sure anyone who's still listening after you said that is only people who have played Final Fantasy or. <laughs> But then I don't get to tell the story about why it's called Final Fantasy that everyone's heard 5,000 times. All right, tell your story. <laughs> I don't actually want to. Um, okay. So basically, it's just a, a long-running series of role-playing games that started on the original Nintendo um, and was very successful, um, kind of bridged the, the gap between mainstream video games, quote-unquote, and super nerdy video games with the Final Fantasy VII um, and then the, it kind of been on a decline for the last decade. Um, the the game that came out today, Final Fantasy XV, was originally announced in 2006. It was a different title then. It was Final Fantasy Versus XIII. It was supposed to be a spinoff of the XIII game. Um, it sat in development hell for a while. Uh, it got changed 
a bunch of times, changed teams a bunch of times, um, eventually changed names, and it is finally out. Um, and we will talk uh, at the end of the podcast about what we think of that game so far. I think we've both played about two hours, so it'll be very, very early impressions. But um, yeah, Michael, so why don't you take over and, and talk about your, well, your introduction to the series? My introduction to the series was watching a friend play Final Fantasy VII in middle school, maybe eighth grade, whenever it came out, and um, thinking it was really boring. And why would you have a game <laughs> where you like pick attacks from a menu? Um, and so I didn't pick it up at that time, but I think the first one I really played, I can't, I, I think it was actually Final Fantasy nine. I think you reintroduced me to Final Fantasy cause you and Nathan really liked seven or eight or something. Yeah. And when nine came out for some reason, I picked it up. And even though it's like not considered one of the best Final Fantasies, like something about it really appealed to me. And then I went back and really enjoyed seven and eight. And maybe somewhere around that time is right through six. And six was like my favorite. Yeah, I mean, I, I have very clear memories of you and me sitting on the floor of your bedroom playing six because it had the cool. Um, the co-op. The yeah, co-op that's thing. probably one of the things that made it such a fun experience is the is the co-op. And just the fact that like. um. It was one of the maybe one of the first games I played that actually had like really good characterization and like emotional moments in it, even though it was a Super Nintendo game. And then that is perhaps a door to like seven, which um, had a a pretty good story on a lot of levels. Yeah. Yeah. So I my experience with this game is from Final Fantasy one way back in on the nintendo entertainment system um i remember being god it must have been six seven years old um and my dad playing this game and he showed me that like you could assign attacks for people and then he would set the controller down and for whatever reason seven-year-old me thought it was the coolest thing in the world that you assign attacks and then set the controller down and the guys just automatically fight for you Uh, i have no (laughs) idea why i thought that was appealing um but i just really liked it and uh I, i think it was like a bonding experience with my dad too. Cause I watched him play the entire game and then eventually played it multiple times on my own. Um, I, I left the series after that just because I never got a super Nintendo. So um the only three that came out before seven in the United States were uh, four and six, but they retitled them yeah. two and three just to be really confusing. Um, but so we didn't get another kind, one. Kind of- for good reason though those were like the only ones really worth porting over i mean that, that's true i think three had some good parts too well five was good um because we eventually got that but anyway um so so yeah so and then uh, i played seven really loved it um and i've played i've since then have gone back and played them all um the only one i haven't beaten all the way through is uh 13 um which is a game i despise um, and I'm not counting all the, the multitude of spinoffs, too, because I like there's been 7000 spinoffs and sequels yeah. and all so these things. How would you rank? You you can ignore most of them because a lot of them are kind of garbage. <laughs> what are your top five Final Fantasy games oh boy. in order? Um, seven. And why? <laughs> OK, That's, I can't do that. Um, I, I think. Well, let's first let's let's st- take a step back here and, and talk about what I think makes the series unique as a whole, um, because there there are a lot of there are a lot of games like this. I think the original Final Fantasy kind of set the standard for what RPGs of this type would be. Um, and the thing that I like the most about the Final Fantasy series is that they never they they reuse themes and they reuse monsters, but they they always are trying to do something different in each one of their games. Um, the battle systems are always a little bit different. The characters are always different. The world is different. Um, it's not really a continuation of the story. It's a completely new story. Um, and I find that really interesting. So. To yeah, read. I agree. Um, and, and, and kind of like um, the tone, I guess, is quite a bit different as well. So like the tone in seven was very, very like dark. And the themes were like um, kind of, you know, anti This was like a, a dystopian future, like the corporations had taken over and like destroyed the planet. Yeah. Um, and then like eight 
was a little bit more um it was like it was kind of like a futuristic e world but with kind of weird like maybe steampunkish aesthetics of like gun swords and stuff <laughs> um and i don't know it was kind of like it, it was almost like more realism they were going for yeah the um, eight was the love story it, so they were going for a more realistic type thing to focus on the two main characters. Yeah. Matt, and then are, are, nine was, was very like traditional fantasy with like knights and your main character was like this monkey thief. Um, and, and then 10, you were like an athlete. <laughs> you were an athlete in, uh, in uh, the Pacific Asian part of the world, which is the first to really do that kind of uh, art style, which, which I liked a lot. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, are you, Actually, yeah, you were confused. you were like a, like an athlete like in I'm, the real world, and then you got transported to the fantasy world. Yeah, no. yeah. Uh, I'm I'm I mean I'm I'm pretty confused. Well, well I'm not that confused because I'm <laughs> sort of familiar with it. But 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 what I was going to ask, like you guys both said, why you liked it, but I wanted to ask a separate question as the audience, which is why are these games so popular? Because they like from what I've seen. I don't see why they should be so popular. So it probably uh, comes off as like a criticism, but no, no. So my, it, it's largely nostalgia. I, I but, think that's correct. Um, they, they were like, a, in, in, in the day before video games were expected to have stories with like real characters interacting and like trying to make you feel something. Final fantasy was like one of the first and final fantasy seven in particular was most people's ex- first experience experience with like a game like that like but there's particularly like one sad moment in it but there's a lot of like good moments throughout we're not gonna spoil the sad moment 20 years removed (laughs) yeah i'm not gonna spoil it guys um but um but it it pushed the envelope of games and be like you you can like this is an art form that can tell a a real story and not just like a quest what what seemed Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go for it. I was just going to say, you know, just watching Final Fantasy VII being played, which is the one I have the most experience with, like, it looked like, to me, what looked fun about it was that it had this, like, open world, and and you could run around and get involved in all these little side quests, and and the story seemed non-linear. No one actually likes that. (laughs) Um, And and, and that's funny, because I, I... I never played them and I never felt compelled to play them. So obviously some part of me was like, that's yeah, I mean, interesting, but not, not actually I, fun enough to do. I wouldn't, I mean like going back, I wouldn't play it now because now there's lots of games with better stories, but it, it would be like one of those games on like AFI's top hundred films list that are on there because they like did something new and expired, inspired like a whole bunch more movies. But like they themselves like aren't really rewatchable. They're see, just like historically important. See, I don't know if I agree with that. A hundred percent. I do think that the lasting legacy of the Final Fantasy games will be the things that they did for the industry as a whole. You're right. But I also think that like this this is a series that is one of the most beloved and and yet one of the most overrated series in history. But yeah, but that I mean, that's like that's like nostalgia stuff. But there's like, still but like I still think seven is a really good game and I still think six is a really good game. And I, I still would play either of those games. And I agree that some of it, the combat is a little slower than we're used to, and a little clunkier. Um, but I still think the core of those games, the core design, narrative design, battle design, world design is well, is well done. That would be a, an interesting challenge would be to see if you can finish another playthrough of Final Fantasy seven now just to see like whether it holds your interest, because I, I mean, I remember good things about it as well. But my experience in going back to play games that I used to enjoy is just like, yeah, I mean, I remember why I enjoyed this. But like now, now there's basically just like better games. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I think this is going to be a agree to disagree thing, but I. I... I would take that challenge and think I could finish that game. I yeah, do it. I mean, you might be right. right. Like you might, it might completely hold up, but well, they're, um, they're, re- I, they're remaking Final Fantasy seven. So <laughs> yeah, I know that won't, that doesn't count, but um, yeah, 
Yeah, no, so, I mean, I think, Matt, to, to attempt to answer your question, I, I think it's, like, a lot, like, a lot of it are people like me who got in on the ground floor, and this just became, like, something I did, and um, I have tried every single one of these new games, even, even when I started to not like them. Um, in, in the post-Final Fantasy X world, the games kind of, in my opinion, took a, a massive nosedive. Um, yeah. Eleven was an online MMO. Um, that I tried and could not get into. Uh, 12 was a, th- a game that had a lot of potential, but was basically like a single player online game, <laughs> which I don't know why you'd ever want to play that. Um, 13 was a-, a mess. It was awful. Um, and 14 was another online MMO that uh, started off so terrible that they had to scrap it and rebuild it from the ground up. And I will say that I've played the game since. They rebuilt it, and 14 is a good MMO, albeit traditional, but it is a good game now, um, which which is why I think I think hope maybe the series is on kind of an upward trend again. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it was a series that was so beloved that has fallen uh, very far, and there have, been, there have been hundreds of think pieces written about the rise and fall of Final Fantasy. I think, actually, there's a giant series of articles titled exactly that. Um, but I, I think it's just so sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, like, let me give you a teaser trailer of Final Fantasy seven in a way that might make it sound interesting, because OK, start talking <laughs> about like some specific reasons why it's good instead of just general like it had a good story. Um, so when you start Final Fantasy seven, um, it, it first of all, it's starts off like right in the middle of something just like a good movie like there's no like you wake up in your room and like talk to your parents and get your first pokemon or whatever you 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 start jumping off of a train and you realize in the first you know you you start off in the middle of a fight in the first few like movements and character interactions um you and this group of people um are eco-terrorists actually you are even worse than an eco-terrorist. You are a mercenary the eco-terrorists hired to help them blow up a um, big, important reactor thing for a, a big corporation. And they don't like you because you're being a jerk, because you're not doing it because you care about anything. You're just doing it for the money. And um, everyone is characterized really well. It's really tense because it's made apparent that, like, you're not a powerful group of eco-terrorists, like you're probably going to fail. Um, and it's just, it, it's got good tension, everyone's immediately characterized, and you're like, like an anti-hero. And there's a lot of open questions. It's like, why am I this person? Why did I decide to do this? Why are these eco-terrorists doing this? And so just like a good story, like it hooks you right away and does all the right things. I think that's a really great, Summary and, and I to to add to it briefly, I think the smart thing that Seven does and something that a lot of the later games failed to do was it 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 shows you in these things and, and it it sets up a world in which you don't really understand what's going on, but it's recognizable enough to where you at least get the basics. Like um, some some of these Final Fantasy stories are so convoluted and confusing that you just don't understand what's happening. But this, like, okay, the basics are are clear enough. Yes, you don't understand how the entire world works yet. Um, you're in this giant city with with plates that hold up, and there's like an upper city and a lower city. Um, so there's class stuff going on. It, it's it it introduces you to the story smartly and gives you informa- enough information that you understand basically what's going on while still making it interesting. So Matt, do you want to play that game? <laughs> I I mean, I mean, yeah, it, it definitely sounds fun. It's it's I'm I'm familiar with it enough to to recognize all the elements you're talking about, and it's interesting because it's like yeah, that's when I was watching it, it was I wasn't necessarily aware that it was the story that I was enjoying, but uh, you're definitely right. I also recall that it has one of the more iconic villains. It has Sephiroth, which gets he he gets like reused and, and homage and so many different things. And I think people probably know who Sephiroth is. who don't know anything about Final probably. Fantasy. Well, and that's, that's the weird thing about Final Fantasy seven is it, it was the most successful. So it's been the most abused as far as 
uh, milking it for every dollar it had. They've made multiple spinoffs. They've made movies and anime and um, everything they can using both the character of Cloud and Sephiroth, the, the main character and the main villain. Um, so I think it's kind of suffered a backlash because of that. Um, the people just are are tired of it. And now it's the one that they're completely remaking, um, of course. But I, I yeah. really do think it's a, a good a good core game in there. Um, and and like and the thing is, like if I if I were to describe another Final Fantasy game, um, like Final Fantasy VI, it's good for completely different reasons. Um, you don't in Final Fantasy VII, you you know start off as Cloud and you play the whole game as Cloud. Cloud is you, um, and you learn more about him as you go. In Final Fantasy VI, it's like a whole bunch of really interesting little vignettes. There's like I think twelve characters. One is the main character. You actually switch viewpoints a couple times, and um, and then they like kind of meet up at various places in the end. But like there's one who's like uh, a reluctant king who had this like you know when when the his father died he and his twin brother like made a coin flip to see like who would have to be king and who would get to go like see the world and do their dreams and you know one of them ended up being king but um it's like you know regretted not having his freedom um there was like a uh like a, a a thief who um i don't remember that much about actually um, there's like, i'm trying to remember these characters and i can't there's a girl who um is like forced to be a magic tech knight she like has magic powers and then they put them in like these little robot things and then she escapes that's like the first character you are and you're like escaping from this empire um and then the thief kind of helps you escape that's kind of how he comes into the story anyway there's like there's like a lot of little character vignettes and they're all you know it's been a long time since i played the game like pretty interesting and it's a pretty pretty light-hearted but still like has moments of feels um yeah i but, mean like every every game is like set up differently and is good for different reasons but they they like try to do interesting narrative things it, it's crazy to me like to think about final fantasy 6 and this is i mean this is still on the, the, the super nintendo when most games were just Right. Be- better graphic versions of Mario or or shooters or fighting games. It's, I mean, it's the- amazing how much emotion you can have by just like having your character sprite like tilt his head down. Yeah, I mean, the opera scene in that game is incredible. Like for for yeah. for what they had, for the resources they had, and the fact that no one had ever really attempted something like that. I mean, this is a, this is a game meant for children on a children's video gaming console. That there's a 15 minute opera scene in the middle of it yeah um and it's, an SES cutscene. yeah yeah and it's so well done like it's incredibly well done and, and it's it, well done not just as an adult looking back on it and saying hey that was good like as as a child you could still recognize that this is doing something special and different yeah i still remember what the opera sound song sounds like because it was actually like well composed by yeah. um that Nobuo Uematsu or whoever. And this, and I this think is still with name. and this is still with MIDI. I mean, this is still chip tunes. I yeah. mean it's it's more chip tunes on the Super Nintendo than they had originally, but still, I mean, they were they were composing with computer noises and yeah. they they made something that sounded beautiful. I mean it's it's spectacular. Um so, so are all these games made by the same people or by like a lineage of people? Because it it would seem to me unreasonable to even expect that they were all of or 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 even some of these games would would continue to be good otherwise you know yeah they were up to a point and i think you can actually um track that to when the game started to go down um because i think it was like that sakaguchi is the creator right michael does that I name don't. does that name ring a I- bell to you I don't remember. I just, I just remember the composer, yeah, um, who has stuck with the series. It's it's um, Hironobu Sakaguchi, Sakaguchi, and he was the director of one, two, three, four, five, six, um, seven, eight. Well, he he switched to producer on eight, um, nine, ten, um. And then, and then ten, and then twelve is where he, I think, 
either left or was removed um, because he's I'm looking at his Wikipedia page right now and he's just listed as a special thanks for Final Fantasy 12. So yeah, and that's where the game the game started. Side. Yeah. Yeah. So and I, actually thinking about it, Final Fantasy 12 is is a game that like feels like two different games. And it's because literally half the team left um, when Sakaguchi left. So they had a new team come in and try to finish this game. And that's why it feels so j- disjointed. Yeah. But but I, I think with 15, what and this is just my speculation on what happened, but um, by the time 15 came out, the series was like so beloved um, that the reason like I, I'm, I'm sure everyone who's worked on it the last 10 years or however long are people who are like in love with the series, even if they weren't the original people and are like trying to do their best to like live up to the series like the message you get when you start the game is like um for for you know beloved fans and newcomers um it's it's kind of got this weird message when you load it up uh, like kind of acknowledging that it realizes its place did you did you see that scott yeah i i i, I think you're right i mean i think it's got the, the people that are adults and game designers now probably went into game design because they played these games growing up. So yeah. I, I think, I think you're, you're definitely seeing that, that, that and maybe that's what's going to bring this series back to some sort of relevance. Um, I don't know. I, I like, I don't, I don't know the details of what happened. It, it on... would be like as if they let star Wars fans work on the new star Wars movies instead of training them out every on a yearly schedule. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's some danger to letting fans and take over something because then it feels like fan fiction. But yeah, it's true. It's but true. Which but is I, sort of what happened with Star Wars. Yeah, ironically, yes, it is. Um, but I, I do, I do agree that um, this game very much feels like like the, the problem with Japanese role playing games in general is that they as much as Final Fantasy itself tried to push the envelope and make changes, they're very kind of rigid in their format. Um, and the rest of the gaming world has caught up. And you yeah. have games that aren't turn-based numbers RPGs that are telling just as interesting and... And, and the better stories, yeah. to be honest. Like, 10, around the time when 10 came out, was kind of when Western RPGs like Knights of the Old Republic were coming out. Um, and, and I would probably say Knights of the Old Republic was one of the first, like, really good Western RPGs. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, and Bioware in general, um, and then they really took over and people didn't care about Final Fantasy anymore because Final, like the JRPG stagnated and Western RPGs finally became good and gritty and like immersive. Yeah. And I think, I think if you look at 13, I think 13 was an attempt to emulate Western RPGs um, while still try- trying to stick to the uh, Japanese roots. And it just made this mess. Like, it's such a weird, terrible, terrible game. Um, yeah. And, and I don't, I, like, like I said, we're, we're two hours into 15. I don't know enough about it to know whether it's going to end up good or not. It sure. seems like the most modern update um, the combat system so far yeah. seems like they're trying to do the Western RPG more actiony. Like I saw a commercial for this this game yesterday, and it called it the beloved action adventure series, and I was like, "Huh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's not yeah, really what not, these games are." I mean, that's kind of what this game is, but that's not what what the rest of the games have been. Um, yeah, but I will say, analyzing this one, um, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of things that. I like uh but like when when i just talked about how final fantasy 7 like threw you into it right away with like questions and action and tension and this one didn't really like the first scene was kind of cool the first scene is you're this kind of spoiled um boy bandy prince leaving the castle with his entourage and your father's like um kind of telling you goodbye in a way where you as the watcher knows that it's like for the last time but um the character doesn't know that yet and it's like okay that's an okay way to start it but 
then like you immediately start doing like fetch quests completely unrelated where you're like oh go oh your car broke down go kill these three monsters and then fetch this gem and then um so that was kind of a squandered opening i think yeah i mean i i agree with you i liked it but only because it felt very much um like this lull before the storm type thing it felt like everything was so peaceful and so serene like even even the the city that you stay in before all the shit goes down is like this this city by the beach and like there's a scene when you're just sitting there like looking at the sunset and like it's like yeah trying to build this this is what this peaceful serene world is and then we're just gonna fuck it up and i haven't and, and I haven't, yeah and that that city was really cool like because they had like this elaborate like pier restaurant that you could go and it was just it was like just designed like it would be a normal like vacation pier restaurant Mm -hmm. um and there's yeah a lot of really cool like immersive world buildy things in there um but it feels more like they made the cool world um and and terrain and everything and then they're like oh yeah we need to like put a game in here yeah and look Um, this is this is this was my fear when they told me it was open world. Um like I, I think yeah. open world games in general can be a good o- thing. Overrated though. Yeah. Because because people look at open world and they just say, Oh, we'll just make a big thing and then we'll just drop a bunch of stuff in it in various locations and then people say, Oh, it's an open world. I, I don't right. I don't think that's fun and, and I'm I'm worried that like this game so far seems like it's a lot of running around or driving around um like they made this big huge world to make it feel lived yeah. in but you just spend most of your time running and i mean that's not fun but i mean i, yeah. I don't want the 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 opposite which is and, like which is what 13 was which is just you literally yeah. just push forward on your control stick for 12 hours and that's all, all that it is i don't i don't know what the obsession is with open world stuff these days because um, it's not just game manufacturers, like also game players, like think that that idea is fun. Like the whole No Man's Sky situation was a great oh, example God, of this, yeah. where it's like, oh, you can do anything. You can go to different planets and they're all different and randomly generated, which to me just means bad. <laughs> and, and then everyone was like, oh, this game sucks. We're so disappointed. And it's like, what were you expecting yeah. from a game where you the, the only thing is that like all the planets? are randomly generated and you can explore them it's like where, what is the game right yeah well, like I all, think all, all forms of art like require you know you're, you're, you're communicating something or, or there's a narrative it's n- not just like sandbox yeah i think grand theft auto was responsible for a lot of this and i i remember i remember watching you play grand theft auto scott and <laughs> which, whichever one it was it it was it was one of the good ones because I remember I don't remember if you were playing and I was watching or if we were taking turns or what. I remember we were like actually really interested in pursuing the story, and it, and it wasn't just like let's see how many cop cars we can crash into or whatever. It was it was like a pretty good story. And and if anything, I probably felt like I wished it was a little bit less open world because you're like ah oh, I have to drive all the way across the city for this. Right. Absolutely. I'd rather just I'd rather just experience this. Um, yeah, but then I, again, I, maybe. This, yeah, I'm go ahead. I was just gonna say like that. I, maybe, maybe they're being more pragmatic and thinking about marketing and, and like. There is a subset of people who really will buy a GTA game so they can shoot down police helicopters and not actually play the game at all. So yeah, I, I don't well, know. That, that's like kind of the Wii Sports fallacy, um, <laughs> where like people think they like GTA because they like um, played it at a friend's house for a few minutes. It's and like just going around blowing stuff up with bazookas and then they like bought it and are like oh this actually gets boring really fast yeah i mean driving um, driving around recklessly is fun for 20 minutes yeah and that's that's about it and like the, but i mean there, there there was a time in in 15 today in my playthrough and why i'm behind you michael where for 30 minutes i just wandered around i got to that um that beachside town and I saw what the quest was, and I said, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna run the other way. Um, and that yeah. was kind of interesting. Except here's, I didn't find anything. Like, <laughs> and I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm hesitant. Like, 
there's supposed to be hidden dungeons everywhere, supposedly, like caves you can find and dungeons that are completely not related to the main story. I don't know if I just wasn't looking in the right spot or whatever, um, but I, I don't know. I just, like, I don't... Yeah, well, when... so, so far there's basically been the beach town and then, like, desert. Right. And, and you're right, there wasn't a lot to find in the desert. And I And I feel like, I think... Maybe this is just an overreaction. I think Final Fantasy XIII was not an open world game until the very end, and it kind of opened up at the end. It was mostly a linear game. But I don't think it's that the dungeons were linear that bothered people. I was I think that it, it did not feel like a real lived in world because there was like there was no towns to go to, there were no shops, there were no people milling around, like living their lives yeah. that you felt like you were experiencing a new culture or a new group of people with Right. differing opinions there was none of that the world didn't feel real so i think you can do that and still have your game be kind of linear as long as you construct it so like they could take what they right. have here which is like that seaside town it looks like a vacation resort like you go to that fancy restaurant and people are sitting there talking to each other um and some of them, some of them are talking about like what's happening in the world but the others are just small chatting about how amazing their vacation is and how is how the good like that that is detail that makes things feel real and you could just make me go from one town to the other linearly and that would still feel like a world to me like right like i i use the uncharted series as an example of um how you can do this right because those are very did, yeah. those are it's very extremely, linear games extremely linear yeah but but it's it's linear in a smart way. First of all, it doesn't it 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 designs it to where you feel like you're discovering the linear path, um, and it, it still feels like a lived in area. Like they they're they're very clever at making the area you're in look expansive and huge when it's actually just an illusion. So um, so what's interesting here? You talk about this um, in in Uncharted and in the most bad open open world type games and in most bad novels the worst thing is travel chapters <laughs> like w when you're going from like one quest idea or whatever to the next it's like everyone feels like there needs to be something in there to fill the time and it, it is always never worth including and then on the uncharted games it's usually like these forced areas in between story where the, you like there's like for some reason 50 soldiers like swarming out of everything and you just you're like oh god i'm really tired of this like duck and shoot thing and i don't know where all these people are coming from it's ridiculous this person has such a large army and why they found me here and <laughs> anyway and then in like open world games it's like you have to travel through the vast emptiness between story elements so like across town in gta and um and of course we all know in in novels the travel chapters um so it's like th i think this is an important fallacy to point out it's like i think it would be fine if you just skipped it moved on to the next point like you don't need filler i, I think so yeah. too I, I think smart writers will use those moments in clever ways to add depth to character um but i think for for the most part you're right um, so like and, I, and and that's actually good a good way to get back on topic a little bit is because I think that there are moments in these these traveling this really small moments between the characters in Final Fantasy XV so far that add a lot of depth to the character and make them feel like a group of friends like I I, I right. love like I didn't think I was gonna love this when I read about this I thought it was stupid I love the idea of you have to set up camp at the end of the night. And, like, one of your guys is responsible for cooking, so he cooks your meal. And then the other guy, like, shows you all the pictures he's taken during the day, which serve as kind of a, this is the recap of everything you've done today. You can see it through a series of pictures. Like, that sounds dumb and kind of a waste of time, but I loved it because it just, it makes, like, it, it brings these people right. together. And, and it, does, it doesn't take up that much time, no. really. Um, and, and another thing, to point out is in the actual traveling when you're in the car you have the option to either drive yourself and do like a car drivey thing if you like that kind of thing or make your like manservant drive <laughs> and you just sit there and listen to conversations and look around and that's what i did because oh, yeah. i hate driving 
in real life and video games. It's like a chore and whenever I have to do it, I just get like frustrated if I ever like have to like use awkward controls and like back up because I get stuck or something. Yeah. Um, and so there's just these little points where you're traveling between locations and it doesn't like teleport you there instantly. You just like sit in the car, but it's only like, I don't, I don't know. It's hard to say because people are talking. So it's interesting, but like maybe 20 seconds or something. And it is actually is an enjoyable, like, um, relaxing, like look around at scenery, immersive time. Yeah. Cause there's like animals running around and like, there's different people doing things. Um, you can you can actually run into other cars if you're driving, which damages your car, which I didn't realize that the, that they would let you do. Um, I, I I don't know. So far, I mean, so far, I I think it's both the best and the worst parts of open world in this game. Um, and we'll see how that plays out. Like in in ten hours, yeah, I could be really it, sick of this. It's going to have to decide really soon. Like if 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 a strong central storyline emerges, I think I'm going to really like this game. And if I have to do one more fucking travel fetch quest, then yeah, I'm um, gonna be frustrated. And this and this is another tangent that I'm gonna go on, but I think it's a good one. the The biggest problem with open world and trying to tr- tell a strong narrative is that an open world game kills any sense of urgency you have. Yeah, um, yeah. The best example of that is the the Batman Arkham games. I don't know if you've played those, Michael. Um, no. Arkham Asylum was a very small contained game where you were trapped in Arkham Asylum and things were like the Joker takes over the asylum and releases all the bad guys and you're trying to track him down while defeating uh, bad guys and it's really great. And then after that, they were like, let's make this an open world game. So the next one was Arkham City, where there's uh, a big city area that you can fly around and do random side quests. And then the one after that was Arkham Knight, which they made the city even bigger and gave you the Batmobile so you could drive around and do all that stuff. But these are all supposed to take place on the night that, like, a bad guy is threatening to do bad things. So you're like, no, hang on, Joker. I'm going to go uh, deal with the Riddler for a little bit. <laughs> right. And it yeah. just kills, like, it just kills the main I, story. 100% agree. And that's why I usually don't do any of the side quests in these open world games is because I'm like, guys, like, He's about to attack the thing. <laughs> yeah. We have that right now. Right. There's no time to find your dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's funny. This this whole time y'all been talking about this, it reminds me of um, EverQuest, which we've discussed before, and and how it, it really everything kind of depends on context and where the stakes are. Because in EverQuest, there is literally no story. Um, yet some of the most intense memories that I have of that game were travel. And that's because the travel is is your idea and it is your goal to get from this city to that city. And there are always horrible, unexpected risks that you're going to encounter. I I, I think the the main good thing about travel, we're talking pre-Loose Line era, um, in that game, was like you didn't have to do it that often. Like usually you would go to like um, that orc place or whatever, and that would be like your home until you got to a certain level. And then you'd like brave up and venture out into the world to your next location where you would like be your home for a while. And and yeah. that's why it was fun is because you didn't have to do it like several times a play. Yeah, yeah, it felt it, like it you were actually, actually something. going on an adventure. Like it felt like you were yeah. like, you've reached this certain point. Okay, it's time to go here. Like you, you get all your ducks in a row. Like you make sure you're right. all ready to go. Like you, quote unquote, yeah, like pack it felt, up. It felt like I was from Kelethin, or um, right. I think that was the city. Yeah. Um, yeah, and like I was scared to like venture too far away from it at first. Right. So it, right. it was it was well done in that way. Yeah, but these yeah. open world yeah. games. Is mostly the travel is not dangerous. It's forced. It's you get you're in this city and you get a quest that says go turn this thing to this guy and he's all the way across the map and you're just like I right. don't give a shit. I don't want to do this. Like, yeah, yeah. Like it would suck if EverQuest was just like full of things like oh you have to go from Freeport to um you know Elf City and then. Uh, and then, oh, that guy has a package for the other guy. Now you have to go back right away. <laughs> right, right. It, yeah, it, it was nice to find quest items and then just drop them on the ground because you didn't actually need yeah. to do anything with them. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. 
So yeah, I, I don't know, uh, Michael. So, so I mean, it sounds like we're we're hesitantly positive about fifteen so far. Yeah, I, I'm enjoying a lot of things. I I told you earlier. Um, there's like little moments, like you know, like a dog enemy like jumps on you to attack you, and like your bodyguard character, like really with really good voice acting and emotion, is like, um, Noctis, like jumps like <laughs> to save you. And actually, another similar moment was like when that weird guy like flicked a coin at you, and like everyone was kind of characterized really well because like you were just kind of like flinched because you're like this kind of spoiled prince who doesn't really take care of himself, but mm-hmm. your bodyguard just like zips his hand and catches the coin before it hits you just in case it's something bad even though it's just the coin and like everyone like reacts really well without having to like tell you what they're feeling yeah and, I, and you feel like they're your friends and i agree and and it, it feels like those small moments are gonna be what i end up loving about this game um because yeah. like like you know when i was a kid like it was the 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 fmv cutscenes that i loved like the like in Final Fantasy VIII, when the two gardens like attack each other, and there's this big dramatic cutscene where they're all fighting, and it's a beautiful for the time graphics. Um, but what I want out of a game now is I want these small character moments, and I feel like the game, so far at least, is spending time on that. And if this game gives me um, more of that, and then a satisfying conclusion for all four of these characters at the end, then I'll call it a success. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's going to have to have the central story at some point. It's not enough just to have these kind of good characters. Well, um, he's got to win his throne and, back. And it, it's There's frustrating because, like, the central story, it doesn't even need to be good. Like, it just needs to give you some purpose and direction so you know why you're playing the game, or at least for me. And so it's frustrating because that was, seems like it'd be, like, the easiest part they could have included and they've just well so far there's nothing it's just um it was cool you know we, we, there was like one moment where it was cool that you haven't even gotten to yet um where like his dad dying finally hits him but like before that um it it's it nothing has happened yeah i, I we'll we'll see i i kind of i kind of if the end goal for him is just trying to get his throne back from this evil empire i'm okay with it that being the level of stakes like i think these games that, tend that to would go... be fine it's just that there hasn't even been presented like a, a plan for doing that like i'm still important characters are still telling me to do things completely unrelated to that idea <laughs> yeah i mean I, I will say that a little warning went off in my head where right after the big the big moment where um your father's killed and you find out about it. Um, you travel back to that hammerhead uh, mechanic shop thing and you see a random quest where it's like, and you go talk to the guy and he basically says, um, Sid says you're not going to be able to go back to your city for a while. So I should give you some work in this area. And I want to be <laughs> like, no, like this is like yeah. a bi- his father was just murdered. Like he should be like that moment where they go, they're rushing to the top of the hill. Um, to see into their city and see if, if what they read in the papers is actually true that, that I loved the pace of that. Like, it feels like you're, you're fighting your way through enemy soldiers and you're like frantically trying to get to the top of this hill. I love that. And I understand you can't keep that level of tension throughout the entire story. Yeah, But, but, it, but also, I mean, like I, I also liked like the roadblock and stuff. It seemed like really realistic way to like lock down a city. Um, but all, but it kind of ruined it right at the end because what do they do once they get up to the top of the hill and like confirm that the city's under attack? They only at that point get out their cell phones and start calling people they know in the city. <laughs> whereas, <laughs> whereas that is obviously the f- first thing you do. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, th- they're having they're having trouble with this fantasy world where people use swords, but it's also they have cars and cell phones and uh, lots of mass media technology that we have. Um, yeah, I mean, I. I well, I, I'm hopeful, and that's that's way more than I could say after three hours into Final Fantasy Thirteen. So, um, yeah, I I really I really think this could turn out really good, and I'm obviously excited about it because I just talked about it on a podcast for an hour. Um, but I don't know. We'll see. I, I think um, I've yeah, never. I'm excited too. 
Yeah. And, and and regardless of whether it ends up being a good game overall, there are parts of it I appreciate them doing. And that's enough, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So Matt, do you want to play Final Fantasy games now? <laughs> well <laughs> Um You know, I think I always enjoyed watching them probably more than I would enjoy playing them, but I, I'm curious about this one you're talking about, if only just to see what a modern game, what, like what a modern RPG is like, because I've been out of the loop for so long. Um, like I think, honestly, probably the last RPG that I watched might have been Grand Theft Auto, like four. You um, you played play Dragon Republic. Age in, in grad school. I didn't you? did play Gr- Dragon Age. Yeah, that's that's the that last was a fantastic game. Yeah, that, that was, was a pretty cool game. I played that on the computer. Um, is this a computer game or a console game, by it's the way? It's console right now. But they're going to do a computer port later, I'm sure. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not trying to be negative. I'm not trying to 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 be a wet blanket. Um it's just it, it, and and so, okay, so the in terms of the gameplay, you guys have um described that it's it's like more modern and kind of more like Kotor where you're s- sort of having like actual action duels but there's numbers involved somehow is that is that more how it is now yeah i mean you have hit points you have magic points but you there's no turn based you attack by mashing buttons and moving out of the way and dodging and that okay. kind of thing yeah well maybe in you know five years or so well. <laughs> yeah i mean I, it's it's interesting to me like for the same reason that we all see movies that we might not think we like will enjoy the premise of but we all like understanding like movies and how they tell stories and what makes them good and what didn't work. That's why we have this podcast probably. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of the same with me and games. Like I really like analyzing games as uh, an artistic medium. Yeah. Right. And, and, and like part of me wonders, and I would love to, I would love to see a take on this game from someone who had never played any of the games, because I wonder if I would even care, like it, like would this game be a blip on my radar as someone who has played a lot of games in their life? If, if I didn't have this long history with this series, I'd probably not. Yeah. Like, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't know I, if I this don't, is even a big release. Like we're going to publish this. <laughs> I exactly. Think, I think most people are going to be like, what What's that? I, I, I mean, I, I, I didn't like I didn't download this. I actually bought a physical copy and um, I wasn't worried at all that it would be sold out <laughs> in, in my small town with one game store um, because I just like assume kids these days don't like obviously don't care about Final Fantasy because no good Final Fantasy was released during their like, you know, adult lifetime. Yeah, although I will say that it is a uh, it is number two on twitch right now it's the second highest number of people watching people stream it so huh. I, I don't know if that's a measurable <laughs> thing yeah, thanks for success but um like th- thousands of people are watching people play final fantasy 15 interesting it's yeah. not really a spectator game but yeah that's like that's uh, matt you you mentioned that you watched your brother play it. i there's some games that I like watching people play. I cannot imagine like watching people play these games would be interesting at all. Like yeah, even, well, even if you're into what's kind the of story, funny about it is I really have no idea what the story was of Final Fantasy VII, despite really trying to pay attention while I was watching it because I would leave the room and then I would come back and then I'd be like, wait a minute, there's pages cloud of is not actually missed. cloud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so. so. I, I yeah I don't like I there's a lot of people that watch people stream games and I I think that's fine and and I do it a lot too but I don't these type of games like I don't see how that yeah, would be yeah you, you'd have to you'd have to like literally watch their like make sure you caught them stream every time they stream right, right. the whole thing or you would miss things right and if you're if you're playing game like I, if I'm playing the game why would I watch someone else play it instead of just yeah playing i I don't know but um yeah so i mean that's that's final fantasy i I mean i you know all said and done i love this series um i i I, 
You asked me which my favorite games are, Michael, and we don't have time for me to go into detail of why, but I think I would say 7, uh, 6, um, 10, 1, and then 9, maybe. And that's yeah. That's off the top of my head, so I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> There, with 15 and reserving judgment on yeah yeah could could, could be anywhere and i mean point. and and uh, frankly i i still have an active subscription to final fantasy 14 um it, it is a fun mmo that i don't play very often because it's an mmo <laughs> but um it, it's it's a good game too so i mean we might look back and say final fantasy 15 was the start of an upswing for the series but i think it actually started with the company's willingness to look at what they made for 14, realize it was a dumpster fire and completely tear it down and build it back up into something different. Yeah. I'm glad they did that. I didn't, I haven't played any of the 14 versions, but you, you probably wouldn't like it very much. It's a very traditional MMO, but it has a story. Um, and it's not, not bad as, as far as final fantasy stories go, but. But that's that's cool. Final Fantasy. Um, maybe one in a couple months when we're both done with the game, we'll we'll check back up and see how we thought at the end. Um, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, before I go, I just wanted to go around the digital table and uh, see what you guys have been watching. If you have any recommendations or anti recommendations, uh, Michael, why don't you go first? Um, um well, there's a movie I saw was Doctor Strange. Yeah, I don't think we've um, which, ever talked about that on the podcast. So what what did you think about Doctor Strange? Well, let me premise this by saying that I pretty much hate Marvel movies. That's but strong. I actually <laughs> I know it is strong. And part part of that is just my nature of like being contrary to what the world likes. <laughs> but um but like they they don't really they don't really have like things that interest me typically in terms of like characterization and and storytelling i i find all of the fights really tedious um but D- dr strange um for some reason i liked uh partially because it's an origin story and the first superhero movie that is the origin story is usually the best one that has like a real narrative structure to it at least where the character like grows starts off as one person and like grows um and then stagnates for the rest of the sequels forever uh, um but and, and i don't know and i don't know why i liked it because actually i also really am tired of benedict cumberbatch playing <laughs> the same character where he's like an asshole genius god i'm um, so tired of it <laughs> yeah so tired but of it. um but i don't know it's just something about the way this the story like the the magic system on some levels didn't make sense but mostly did because they didn't really actually say what the limits were but like the main thing they used was just kind of like this teleporty sideways world thing Mm -hmm. um which felt like the rules were okay and they introduced the time travel thing early that was crucial to the ending and so that came together all right um but yeah it was it's pretty good see it's funny because we uh we kind of come from opposite ends of the spectrum on Marvel. Um, you don't like it very much. I absolutely love the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and we kind of passed each other by on this because <laughs> I think you probably liked this movie more than me. You didn't um, like this one. I, I didn't. I mean, I won't call it a bad movie. I think it's a good movie, but yeah, I, it was the first time for me that the Marvel formula really started showing itself. And I okay. know, like, it was the first time for me that I agreed with a lot of the complaints that, that you and I have discussed in previous <laughs> movies, yeah. um, that, that the sameness of these films and, um, th- how, like, how, like, like I, the villain, I didn't think the villain was very good at this movie oh, yeah, at all. The, the villain was really bad. Yeah. yeah. And, and it just, it felt very much like this is, this is the Marvel origin story structure. And this, like you could slot Iron Man into this movie and it followed the same, path basically and i know the details are a little different but it was structurally kind of the same movie um, right and i agree with you like i'm sick of benedict cumberbatch i think he needs to do something different really soon um i just i was never interested in the doc in the doctor strange character um i will say that i liked the ending a lot um but 
I, I yeah, don't know. Like, I, I agree. I mean, I agree with you. Like, the villain didn't make any sense. He was just bad for no. Like, why? Why? Like, why? Why would you invite this horrible, obvious demon creature into the world? Yeah. Um. Well, and, and, and like, but, I like Mads Mikkelsen a lot. Like, I really like him as an actor. I think he's very talented. But yeah, but he's completely wasted he's given here. Yeah. A non-character to play. Yeah. I think maybe the reason that it kind of appealed to me is um, just the philosophy of the main character. Like he, he was like, no, he like, he, he got like injured in a pretty stupid way actually. Um, but he was like trying to figure it out. He like, he, as a doctor, he was like making all of these other doctors like perform these experimental surgeries on him that he thought could theoretically work because um you know, he was a problem solving type of person. And, mm-hmm. and I like I like it when characters in these movies like think in problem solving ways and not j- just normal superhero ways of thinking, which are, I'm tired of, which is like, um, oh, you can't kill any of the bad guys. And um, I have to like surrender here because they're holding like this one person hostage and um <laughs> Like just, just like you know, like ways of thinking that that don't make sense under non superhero construction, and um, and they they kind of were a little bit more realistic with with the main characters thinking in this one. But I, I, I mean, I also didn't think this was like a good movie. I was just pleasantly surprised that um, someone took me to a Marvel movie and I didn't hate it. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, so that's that's Doctor Strange. It is still playing now. I think it's doing quite well at the box office. Um, so I'm sure there will be many Doctor Strange sequels, and he will be dropped into the rest of the cinematic universe. Uh, Matt, what about you? What have you seen recently? Well, uh, in, in the course of three days, I watched the three good Jack Ryan movies, um, which Richard. obviously are... Um, um, Clear and Present Danger, The Hunt for the Red October, and Patriot Games. Um, and uh, they're all pretty good still. Did Actually, I, 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 I had somehow never really seen Clear and Present Danger, even though I thought I had. Like, I'd seen it on TV, and, and maybe it's one of these cases where when you see it on TV, they just take parts out because they're, like, like just for time. Um, so the movie made more sense this time. and. Um, it's probably the worst of the three, though. And uh, so you haven't I, I, you haven't seen the Chris Pine one or the uh, the Ben Affleck one. I saw the Ben Affleck one, and I don't remember being impressed by it. But I also don't remember thinking it was a travesty. And then the Chris Pine one, I just it looks looks pretty generic for the previews. Yeah, really if you're wrong about yeah. that. And I like Chris Pine a lot, but yeah, it was I never saw it, but it looked very very generic. Yeah, but yeah, those are all all classics. Where did you? Were they available? I think Amazon. I think they were all on Amazon streaming for free. Um, so so why not? There you go. Yeah. So I saw a bunch of movies over Thanksgiving break. Um, but I'll I only talk about one for for time purposes. Um, the movie I want to talk about is called The Edge of Seventeen. Um, it is done by director uh, Kelly Freeman Craig. That's a, a women woman director there for you, Michael. Um, <laughs> this is a movie starring uh, Haley Steinfeld, who plays a 17 year old girl um, going through a lot of dramatic things that 17 year old girls go through. Um, it is, it, you know, obviously I have never been a 17 year old girl, but I can imagine that this is the closest approximation to what it would be like. Um, Haley has a, a, a older brother who's like perfect in every way. And she's kind of the, the um, kind of outcast one. And her uh, best friend starts dating her older brother, um, which kind of destroys her emotionally. And, and when I'm saying this out loud, it all sounds like very generic teenage movie things. But um, this movie is so sincere and so funny and really, really wonderful. Um, I think you guys should see it if you get a chance. I believe it's out wide. Yeah. It sounds it sounds probably actually like the kind of movie I'd like where it's just like 
really well done characters interacting. I really think you would like it very much. Uh, Woody Harrelson plays a teacher in it, and he is phenomenal. Um, Kira Sedgwick plays Haley Steinfeld's mother, and she's really, really good too. And of course, uh, Haley Steinfeld is amazing. Um, she was really good in True Grit. That was kind of her coming out movie. Um, and then she disappeared for a while. I think she tried to have a pop career for a little bit. Um, but this is this is finally material that is worth her acting ability, and she's really, really good in it. So that's The Edge of Seventeen. It's out now. Cool. And that, gentlemen, is all we have for this week. Um, next week, Matt, I think we're talking about doing another director, uh, Deconstructing Director series. I think we're going to do Shane Black, because it's Christmas, and Shane Black loves writing about Christmas. So that will be, uh, we'll be talking about Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, Iron Man 3, Michael's favorite movie, and um, oh, God. this year's The Nice Guys. Um, all movies that I really, really like, and we'll also be talking about the other movies that he's just written and not directed, which is Lethal Weapon, Long Kiss Goodnight, uh, and many others. Uh, I think, I'm, I'm excited. I don't know about you, Matt. Oh yeah, I love the, I love the deconstructing directors. I, I've seen I think less of the movies um, that he's directed than I than I usually see for the for these episodes. So I'll have to catch up. Um, but I've definitely seen the ones that he's written more of. I think actually. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. For the longest time, he was just known as the guy who sold a Lethal Weapon script for a, an amount of money that no writer had ever made in their lives. <laughs> so, uh-huh. um, but yeah, I mean, he's he's shown I think with these past few films that not only is he a very good writer but he's a very talented director as well kiss kiss bang bang is one of my favorite movies so uh, okay that'll be fun then that's next week um but for now michael are you available anywhere on the internet are you like to be secret uh i don't um don't exist you don't participate in that okay matt how about you um on twitter at more than a mail Awesome. Uh, I am also on Twitter at ScottDaily85. That's D-A-L-Y. Uh, you can also follow the Daily Planet Twitter at Daily Planet Films. Um, that'll have information on all our new articles and podcasts and everything else we do. Um, you can also see it at DailyPlanetFilms.com. Um, if you could please uh, subscribe to this podcast, share it, um, review us on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, um, anywhere else <laughs> anywhere you find it uh, if you could take the time to to share and review that'd be great um that's all that's all we have for this week michael thanks thanks for again for coming on we gotta have you on more often we missed you you're welcome <laughs> and uh and for the rest of you we'll see you next week podcast is over it's done we hope you all had some fun go back to your work or your school Maybe the gym. Hey, that's cool. Regardless, just go away. Please come back next week.